Hello and welcome to another episode of the Leadership in Construction podcast. I'm your host, Michael, and today I'm joined by the absolutely fantastic Damien Meenhan, who is the um, Logistics Sector Lead for WSP UK. And today we're going to talk about how we empower young people in in construction and the win-win culture. So, Damien, welcome to the show. Hi, Mike. Thank you very much for inviting me to uh, to talk to you today. Thank you. The, the pleasure is absolutely all mine. And just for a little context, a little bit of background, just so that to, to people, how you and I know each other. So, Damien and I, um, we worked um, historically at RPS together, uh, where I currently work. Um, and sort of the memory that I have of, of, of Damien working together is the ability to sort of have that appreciation and that experience of working sort of, I like to call in the trenches, you know, having all that background experience of being able to um, do the job as well as, um, as a, as, as a leader, as a director level. Um, so that's for me, the, the difference sort of being within the blender and, and also being in the helicopter. And I think that's a quite a strong attribute that, that direct leaders absolutely need to have an appreciation what it's like to be in the blender and what it's like to be in the helicopter. So that's, that's my memory of you, Damien, and I'm so glad that we'd be able to have this this opportunity to have this conversation and 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 find out more from you about about leadership. So thank you ever so much. Sure, thank you. Um, so I was going to ask to start off with if you could give us a little bit of a background behind yourself and how you got into construction and and how did you get to the position you're in now? Of course. Um, so I've been in the industry about uh, well about 26 years. Um, started off working with uh, two uh, very large contracting businesses in the UK, Balfour BT and uh, what is now Skanska, uh, working on transportation projects, uh, the M1, the A1 and uh, the Supertram project in Sheffield. Uh, and I did that for the first few years of my career. And obviously, you know, that grounds, I think, everybody that works in construction, um, especially at the time that we're going back to. Uh, following that, I um, change of personal circumstances led to me then going into local government. And so I worked with two East Midlands uh, county councils, Leicestershire and Nottinghamshire, and changed career you know, it, direction quite, quite significantly. It had gone from contracting, of course, but to something that was quite niche, uh, which within traffic engineering, and again spent uh, a few years uh, in that. And whilst that, whilst I was um, working in in local government, I was then undertaking a, a master's uh, degree in traffic and transportation, which allowed me to go and do European travels and go and see some of the best practice from around Europe, particularly Germany. Uh, the Netherlands and and France, so that was that was really beneficial. That that really broadened um, my horizon and, and brought the learning, you know, sort of internal. Um, and then following that, and ever since, I've moved into a consultancy, and so I've worked from very small businesses, you know, sort of a handful of people, all the way up now, and now working with WSP UK which you know is in the uk we're about i think we're over seven thousand strong approaching eight thousand and we're about fifty thousand worldwide so it's a very large very complicated very complex business um and you know i get exposed to a multitude of projects but as you've said and, and introduced me mike my role within wsp is as the logistics lead uh, for the UK business. 
So my job really now is to to develop the market for WSP. And I think a good chunk of it is about um, making our offer suitable for the market because it's quite demanding. It has its own needs, like all the sectors, of course. But because of, I think, as we've all come to a, acknowledge logistics is a very fast moving uh, sector we all need those toilet rolls we all need those those goods on the shelves and covid of course has brought all of that back to all of us it without overstating i think i think we can all probably accept and acknowledge that logistics is the glue that holds our society together and so that's what for me what makes it a truly great sector to be working in and it's it, it, it's it's a really exciting time to be in and amongst it. Um, so th- that that's a sort of potted history in terms of you know the, the jobs. But um, alongside some of that, and and I should say, um, during my early uh, consultancy career, I also did a, a an MBA and did that part time as well as my master of, of science degree. Which was a challenge, of course, trying to mix mm. that with 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 uh, home life. And I had a very young child at the time, I had two young young children. My middle daughter was only about three weeks old when I was completing my mm. thesis. Uh, so that was, you know, that that had its own pressures. Um, and you know, and, and that's, but that has sort of that has really shaped a lot of what. I think it is 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 of a real interest and, and and drives me motivates me mm-hmm. um because it then set the the sort of pathway that I took later on when I became chartered a chartered mm-hmm. engineer with the CIHT and I've been now reviewing candidates for the titles of chartered engineer incorporated engineer and engineering technician and I do a lot of work now with apprentices in terms of getting those professionally qualified. So that has been a real strong theme for me. Um, mm. And as part of that reviewing process and, and getting the experience uh, a lot that goes alongside that, that's then sort of led me, given me the opportunity to take uh, take positions within the institution mm. around um, what's known in that circle as the engineering professional standards panel Mm -hmm. and not only within the CIHT but also with the institution of civil engineers um, I'm part of the panel I'm a board member of the of the G of the joint board of moderators who accredit UK and international undergraduate and postgraduate civil engineering degrees so again you know it's a very important part of what you know what matters to me yeah um i mean again that's another one of the memories that i have of working at rps with yourself is is being able to sort of speak to you impartially about career routes and what might i do might I go and do a master's or might I go and do uh, get my incorporated stasis and, and, and things like that and that helped me sort of having that impartial um, person to be able to speak to helped me to sort of decide on which path i went down and just for context as well i am um, uh, incorporated engineer through the institute of Char- uh, civil engineers so we were members of the same institution, as well as obviously the uh, high, uh, Chartered Institute of Highways and Transportation. Um, and like you, um, I am very passionate about um, helping others on that career path through EngTech and through IN. So I mentor um, uh, graduates going through the training agreements uh, within RPS at the moment. And I think that's, a, that's an absolute shared passion as well in order to to look out for the next generation of engineers and and this year i think is quite an interesting year from speaking from a ic perspective in that they've changed the standards slightly um in a few key areas really to focus in on the changing world it's you know the the, the standards that i set are slightly different from the standards that people are mentoring now are going to sit and that will be constantly evolving and i think that's your role in in certainly a part of that for the uh, setting the um the expectations at university level and at a char- chartership level is absolutely essential because the world's emerging, the world's changing. So now the emphasis 
from the ICE is very much on sustainability. Um, and obviously that is a lot of lot of people going to that way as well and whole cost life and analysis and stuff. So, um, you know, I think that's uh, these are essential um, roles that you don't necessarily see in the background all the time or, or take credit from, you know, from you get your job title and that's about it, you know. So, <laughs> so yeah, you know. It's, it, it, it absolutely is, Mike. I mean, the the joint board of moderators who set that that benchmark for the universities to follow. I mean, they are planning for jobs that don't even exist at the moment, mm -hmm. but obviously will during the career of an engineer, you know, whether they're in contracting, whether they're in consultancy, in whatever space they're in, those those key skills have to be established and laid down in the early part of their careers. And so mm -hmm. it's the JBM's place to get to communicate that and have those put in place so net zero you know is so important we hear it mm. so much at the moment but it's an absolute central tenant of of what an engineer's education and experience should be about so you're absolutely right you know sustainability cannot be over overstated i think mm. it's also worthwhile just touching on um you know the the skills as you say are changing and so it's not just now purely technical engineering skills mm. but it is around the management and leadership pieces uh, of an engineer's training or you know or, or those in construction in general and mm. so i mean again coming back to my own practice i knew i had to to go beyond and, and stretch myself which is why you know i, I wanted to to start looking at uh, qualifications such as an MBA and then la mm. later go on to become chartered manager because it was so important to me to understand that as, as my career progressed and I developed that you know that they would be key skills and again that's what I try to bring back in conversations with with mm. others. Yeah that's <clears throat> that's great I'm, I'm, I'm sort of pleased that you're touching on this because this is kind of getting into the, the meat of this 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 podcast today which is a really about empowering and 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 the younger generation coming through into the into the construction sector um so the sort of first thing i wanted to sort of ask you know so uh your experience is sort of very similar to mine is that at some point in our career we realized that all that technical knowledge that we had uh was good to get to a certain point to go further it we needed other skills we needed more leadership management type skills um and looking back at my career i could see that certainly uh, in the ICE uh, and, and, and through my career, I didn't have that sort of education of what leadership is. And I know with my involvement in universities that that is starting to emerge a lot more. Um, from your perspective, working with universities and, and institutions, are you seeing now the introduction more about um, the emphasis of leadership? The syllabuses at university are very, very busy. And, mm. you know, there has to be that recognition from the outset that there's only so much lecture time and accommodation, really, to cover the bases that, that are so necessary. Um, so I think it, it places a duty on early career professionals, young graduates, you know, to, to go beyond and, and to become self-starters anyway. And with the right help and support, and I think understanding what they want alongside what a business might want and and then trying to marry those two together to make the true success of it, mm. it is so critical. But I think coming back to the question around how universities are going about it, that they're doing that they, they're, they're making good, solid steps, I think is, is fair to say from the visits that I've undertaken. Um, could they do more? Perhaps, perhaps, but it would be at the cost of something else. And so, yeah. you know, there has to be that trade off. That's interesting because I've not seen it in that perspective before. As I say, I've got a talk coming up at the moment with the uh, University of East London of a similar sort of topic. Um, but that's that's quite an interesting. What you said there was about young professionals um, starting to take the lead of their own education, their own uh, what skill sets are they going to need? Because certainly I, as I found as you become a graduate and you get into construction is it big contracting or consulting or, or surveying or whatever the emphasis is very much on 
learn the skills because we, we we've employed you to do you know design a pavement so i need you to design a pavement and that's the sort of thing you fall into this i suppose it's a little bit of a trap in a way you fall into the trap of i i, I want to you know get better at designing and, and or building so that's what you go and, and emphasize on um and for, certainly for me it wasn't until later in my career that i realized i need the leadership side of things too mm. yeah so, absolutely. so you believe how much do you think an organization needs to play a role in in molding uh young professionals in in their leadership journey i, I think the business itself plays a, a pivotal role i mean uh, i have said about you know, early career professionals being self starters. And that is absolutely the, the foundation for it. But the mm. business has a has a very big responsibility and duty to that individual. But also, if it's going to realise the true value of that individual and tap into that talent, mm. it has an awful lot to do. And I think that comes then back to how senior managers within that business behave mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i've heard it spoken about being the new leadership of okay. being more altruistic compassionate and empathetic and i don't mm -hmm. quite subscribe to that i think that was mm -hmm. always a part and parcel of leadership what what it means to me as a senior manager within wsp mm -hmm. um, because again i sort of contrast today's practice with what I began with you know as a as a, as a young graduate in a contracting business mm. which was let's say probably considered now very much old school <laughs> yeah um, and so it was I always felt it, it was one of those where it was sink or swim yeah and you had to fight hard to be recognized and acknowledged and I promised myself back then the sort of manager and ultimately leader that I would want to become would be one of those that perhaps put their arm around mm. around young professionals and say, look, I can help you. You tell you manage me and I can help you. And so yeah. I think going back to maybe the point you made at the start, Mike, around, mm. you know, being being in the trenches, yeah. that is really where it sort of stemmed from for me was about, you know, facilitating that learning piece yeah. making challenges but within a sit but within a um an environment that is protective and that mm -hmm. early career professionals can explore thoughts yeah. you know and and start to develop that and without fear mm. but but still making progress you know having boundaries set nice and early yeah and then monitoring that progress as we take each step forward and then what you find beyond you know with, with within very short space of time is that individual is is just absolutely flying that's yeah. what i see with, with absolutely with the people that i work with and i think and and i harp on a lot about this uh, and i'm at risk uh, getting bored <laughs> or boring people that i see leadership very close to, to what it's like to be a parent. Because I was learning how to be a leader at the same time I was learning how to be a parent and I can see the similarities. And what yeah. you just described there is is, is, is kind of how, like what you do with children, the way you, you set the boundaries and you give them that uh, availability, that freedom to be able to often go and explore and, and make mistakes and, and get injured. Uh, and you as a parent, your duty is really just to sort of be there as comfort and safety and, and um, support really. And I think that's the same thing, isn't it? It, it there's a lot of crossover clearly um you know and and, and that the analogies are, are very closely aligned um because it, it it's it, it is how we, i think we as humans develop you know we we mm. want we don't want to develop in in a sense of ab, abject fear we want we want to be you know we want to be challenged we need to be challenged because if behaviours aren't quite correct, they need to be corrected. And and again, you know, like to use the parent analogy, you put them on a different trajectory. You help you help them make that change. But um, yeah, it, it's it, it's it's a good point. Mm. And the the thing that we, we you sort of really emphasised there was was about um, 
the experience side so you know you had experience of a, of a different perspective being a contractor and then being in local government and then being a consultant lots of different perspectives there and all you talked about as well uh, of giving young professionals uh the uh, space in which to sort of trial different things and have that freedom and, and, and to sort of make mistakes and, and test the waters and find their own feet. And, and how important do you think it is for young professionals coming into the industry to sample different parts of the, of the industry? Because it's like myself, I've only ever been a designer I and mean, I've had the good fortune of being able to be a designer, but be on site as a supervisor or as a project manager or as a designer. And and I love having that variety and it's given me the perspective of the contractor when I'm designing something. How important do you think that is in, in, for, for young professionals? Um, I think the, the, the obvious answer would be very important, but I think it's also a product of the quality of the experience. So it simply wouldn't be enough to become a contractor for a period of time if that experience wasn't deep and, and and somewhat meaningful um mm -hmm. so i think it's about for me it's about the quality of of the experience and, okay. and what you gain from that and how you come to understand the boundaries the constraints and more of the holistic nature of, of the project that you'll be working on or projects mm -hmm. you'll be working on so whilst i think a broad appreciation is absolutely essential that doesn't have to be gained in just one area if it is gained in multiple areas uh fantastic and again you know if, if it can be taken to a point where you get in and behind and underneath the veneer of that area then all the better i have to say for myself i, I was very clear in my mind i think looking back that i wanted to become as a, a as 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 experienced as I possibly could in several areas, we've mentioned contracting, uh, local government and consultancy, but you know also areas like um, lecturing. So I, mm. I try to to do other things, you know, and and just see, not not to understand is that where I, my heart belongs, but but just to put that different slant on things, to have some space in which I could think differently. That for me mm. was was really important. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it, 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 your character, your personality comes out as very sort of open to those sort of new challenges and open to the sort of new um, going outside that comfort zone. Has it always been like that or is it something you've had to work on? Um, it's, that's a very good question. Um, I think, in honesty, it's only something I've come come to appreciate in later life. I mean, I'm now approaching 50 um, and I think that growth mindset, as we now label it, of course, is, you know, yeah. it is it is probably part of uh, I've come to understand it more as I've got older. I think I always always had it clearly because yeah. I wouldn't have gone along the career path I've chosen without it for those very reasons that I just mentioned. But mm. I think I've come to understand it much more as, a, as, as you know, as I've entered middle age. So. Yeah, I think answering the question is it's always been part of me and it needs to be mm. part of, of us all, especially as you do go into uh, different stages of, of your career. It strikes me that if we don't have the growth mindset, you know, we stagnate. And clearly, if we stagnate, we start to go behind and and to, to build to build momentum and to build motivation. You need to, you know, to, to be challenging. I think, and, and challenging not only, you know, the norms, but most importantly, yourself. Yeah. About and, what and you and understand. I, absolutely. And I think a key, a key aspect of that as well is knowing where you're at. And and I think to help you know where you're at, having a good good mentor or, or good someone that can, can reflect back on you in, in terms of where you're at. Because we have a very biased opinion of ourselves, I can <laughs> testify. And it's very good to have that sense check of someone to say, actually, no, that's you completely got yourself out of there. I think that's well, fair. Have you had a mentor in that, uh, that's helped you, guide you, guide you? I've worked with some fantastic people over the years and I've worked with some terrible people. But I have to say, I've learnt as much from, from each one of them. You know, you, you come to, the, there's the appreciation of constructive criticism 
and that's an art it's a skill that you know i think we all need to get better at I, you know we all can shut down and close down and think we're you know we, we've got that base covered but actually you know you miss an opportunity if you close your ears and, and close your mind to it so that that i think is it perhaps goes without saying but a, a lot of the value that i took out of the experiences and the people i work with like i say a lot of it actually was some of those people that didn't do it quite right that i swore at that point i would try to to be different from um you know and, and we're all products of our experience but um yeah the, the, there's been some great people along the way um mm. and i've learned an awful lot you know far far too much to, to cover in a podcast such as this <laughs> i'm sure i'm sure i mean i think i do think it's it's key within organizations to have um a mentorship type program or a coaching program and the, and the mm. two are certainly different um absolutely and, and one of one of the things i love about my job is being able to to have those meaningful conversations with mentoring and, and coaching people through and seeing others grow and i certainly think once mm. you start to get into that leadership mindset it is it does become more about other people and the growth of them and in turn that helps you absolutely what I'd like to do, so what i'd like to do is just go back a little bit to to organizations and their role in the development of of young professionals mm. um and um, I, th- th- this might come from from your experience to say at WSP, but um, how much in terms of, of I see it as investment. So how much time, money, effort should organisations in, in, invest in? I suppose it, it's slightly hard to quantify, um, but how far do do organisations or should organisations go? Do you think in that early stage investment? It, it is a very a uh, difficult question to quantify i think the the way i would best answer it is by saying that there should be no limit upon the investment and um my practice with 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 the guys and, and the and the girls that i work with is is simple you know it, it's regular frequent touch points and around every opportunity that we can bring in to learn something else and that and, and the, the difference is nowadays perhaps from when i started my career is once upon a time senior members of the team you know communicated and, and taught down but now we're seeing a very different paradigm it's actually much more two-way which is fantastic because in every interaction you know in this regard in this regard I get as much as they do, hopefully, um, from the exchange because I'm learning things now that, you know, with te- the march of technology, I learn as much. So there's always times where we can learn from each other and, and I use every opportunity I possibly can. Um, clearly, you know, the day is only, you know, so long, <laughs> but, you know, it's so important. So I, I, I would never seek to limit the investment time certainly that i would would make with yeah. uh, with my with my teams yeah and and what i like about that is is the time and you see time as an investment as opposed to spend um time when you spend with people developing people learning yourself from people it's mm. i always see it as time invested as opposed to time spent so i, oh, I absolutely. always I like by the sounds of it yourself i like to make sure that, that that time is 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 in there even if it's in the diary to to do that one-on-one with yeah. people and, and 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 invest in that time so yeah. um one last sort of question around empowering um the sort of younger generation of, of, of young professional coming into this into the sector um how ca- just to sort of summarize it how can we or organizations empower um the younger professionals it's a very very good question um i think it starts hitting the environment and and that can't be overstated because it's absolutely the bedrock and it starts with the cultures and the behaviors of the senior leaders within the business and it it could it does come down and sets that and and it has to be one of where 
where people take ownership of their own development but are active you know and and when i say active what i mean is they seek opportunities both for themselves for others and the business and so i think that for me is probably the absolute the absolute must of, of what a an organization has to do now the challenge i suppose would be how do you how do you actually bring that together but it, it's about how again the senior leaders communicate and and make people you know feel valued so it comes back to a well-being piece as well mm-hmm. and and that is so important because i think you know listening to your other episodes in the podcast that you know, well-being is so intrinsically important now. We, we mustn't overlook our mental health and, you know, the steps we take to safeguard that and to allow people space and time in which to focus and then start to think about some of these important things like how do you develop, you know, how are they going to develop? How do they move forward? How does the business facilitate that? Mm. Does that answer the question? Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's making that environment through predominantly what, what you were saying there was through culture and behaviours, and I think that's that's a, 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 one of one of the absolute key aspects, and it's it's lead by example, isn't it? But those behaviours. It is for me. Yeah, yeah th- that that I that's. Agree. I mean, whether people would wholly agree, I'll leave that to their own opinion. But for me, that's that's exactly it in a nutshell. Brilliant. Um, I want to just come on to the other topic that we were going to talk about, um, sort of semi-briefly, <laughs> is is about this win-win win-win culture. What what the hell is win-win culture? Surely that doesn't exist in the construction industry. What are you on about? <laughs> um, yeah, well, again, perhaps it's a it's a little bit old school versus new school, as we'll call it. Mm. Um, for me, you know, again, I look back at the early parts of my career and and not so early parts, you know, sort of mid career as well. And it's always struck me that whenever one side tries to dominate or win, you Mm. never realize the full value of what that relationship, what that exchange, what the outcome could be. It Mm. always misses something. And, you know, if I think, if you change the game and you always seek to find common ground where we can and a culture where people understand that they can give of their best whilst being challenged, you get a much better outcome. Things just improve, you know, quality program, Mm -hmm. the costs, all seem to follow they just fall in line with that and so win-win for me is is always my sort of starting point and you know we all have to have we all live in a in a commercial uh, yeah. environment so we all understand of course the rules of the game that sometimes conflict you know is inevitable it is something that we have to deal with as as leaders as senior leaders within the within a business and how you deal with that is important but that alone, you know, if you think about how you deal with conflict, that tends to be around, you know, getting under the surface, mm-hmm. getting beneath the surface of, of the, the iceberg, getting really down below and understanding what really happens underneath people's feelings, emotions. And so it's for me, it, it's it's around trying to use those techniques and those those tools to facilitate a you know a a win-win where both parties walk away happy and ultimately it just delivers so much more Mm, absolutely so this this is stepping beyond that commercial agreement of providing a service for a fee you know it's about what value and and uh, can can a contractor or a consultant bring to a client but also equally what value can a client bring to your consultancy or to your contracting because it has to be as you say each way and um you know we talk a lot about what can as as, a speaking as a designer what value can i bring to my clients and Mm. we talk very little about what what a value a client can bring to me um anything more you can sort of add to that um 
I mean, it can't be overstated. Each party always brings value somewhere, and the extraction of that is is the challenge and the art. You know, it is about you know what is that art of the possible. Um, I mean, within WSP, we talk about being trusted advisors. We always want, we always seek to become trusted advisors to our clients. Uh, so where there is that absolute top level of trust between each other, of recognition of each other's skills and inputs and qualities, you know, and, and how we as a team use each other's experiences and knowledge and insights to deliver the best possible product that is, you know, available to us. And of course, we understand that there'll be certain areas that we don't understand. But within that sort of environment where there is that that win-win position almost from day one, if not from day one, you know, you can you can obviously chase down a lot of issues very, very quickly before they get to issues when you when you understand and can make reliance upon the client and the client can do the same in return and then in any other party to that whether it be a contractor or sub sub consultant whomever Mm. Mm. so i think i'm just wondering um and it might be a bit too left field but you know whether you break down these barriers of different uh organizations you know and and you almost set up a project to project 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 teams or project organizations which is made up of the client the consultant the contractor the suppliers you know the the sub subcontractors you know and and you all work as all all, all, all as one it's an extremely difficult arrangement um, but it, i was trying to just break down those boundaries that that you know you uh, these arbitrary completely made up companies that we work for we work on these boundaries it seems a bit strange when you think about it in that that aspect well, the, the thing is, you mentioned boundaries and quite right as well, because, you know, what is, let's say, a WSP? WSP mm. only resides in companies' house as a, as a, as a document. WSP yeah. is the people that work for it. You know, that, that, that's the, to give it its grand title, that's the reification of the business. You know, the, the, yeah. the making real of that, of that business is it's the people behind it. And it's the same for any business. And so, you know, that that's the key to this. It's not about whilst whilst we do have those boundaries, and of course we have to, because that's how we organise ourselves, but it shouldn't be the limit. And I mm. know it's very it can be very difficult. And we talk about silos, don't we? And that that it would yeah. be a classic example of silo mentality, of how people fit themselves into into that. But mm. we need to go beyond it. It is challenging. I don't think, you know, there can be anyone that would say anything else. But, you know, it, it's it's so it's so important to try and get beyond now, I think, as we enter a different world with new yeah. paradigms as we come out from COVID, you know, hopefully yeah. very, very soon. And and we we shift to a new way and we hopefully can, you know, can can improve upon what's gone before. Mm. Couldn't agree more. So, Damien, I've really, really enjoyed this conversation. You've been great to sort of catch up and 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 to to share some highlights and and particularly, you know, uh, all the all the you know, wisdom that you've managed to share has been absolutely fantastic. So, I'm gonna we're gonna have to wrap this podcast up in a minute. But before we do, I just want to thank you so much for for taking this time to share with us about uh, empowering the the your sort of young professionals and the next generation of people coming into the construction sector, which I think we share as a hugely important aspect to the future of the construction industry. Um, so before we do go, Damien, I would like to just ask you one last question, which is what do you think is the most important aspect of leadership? I think of all the dimensions of leadership that are acknowledged it's got to be authenticity. You know, uh, again, I'm, I'm looking very much on my experience and my interpretation. But for me, having open and honest relationships is the bedrock of, of everything that then follows. And 
under that sort of authenticity piece, you know, of, of acting with integrity and and and, and being self-aware that within your conversations you you know you share values and that you challenge one another and you build and by doing so you build that trust so for me authenticity absolutely trumps pretty much everything people may take a different view and you know the different dimensions of leadership you know of, of things like vision achievement ownership and uh, collaboration they are vital you know you, you can't be that rounded leader perhaps without them but for me i think authenticity just stands you know it just stands above those because it's so important yeah. to me and i think that probably frames really a lot of the conversation we've had absolutely damien that is absolutely fantastic and again thank you ever so much for being a guest and agreeing to share your time with us and and, and thank you it's been an absolute pleasure thank you mike Thank you.